So I think one of the first and most important questions to ask is, is why are we here today? Why have we convened this meeting and called colleagues together to discuss and launch the research engagement programme and also to explore the meaning of research for academic libraries? Well, today's event and the wider research engagement programme that we're launching today is really there and is designed to celebrate, share and support the role of academic libraries as research partners and leaders, as contributors to research in their own right, to celebrate the considerable skills, the knowledge and the expertise which is contained within academic libraries uh, and the contribution that they can make to the research process, to share our collective experiences of doing so, what are some of the strengths that we have in terms of conducting research? What are some of the areas of challenge that we might have to overcome? And then really importantly, to support members of the academic library community to continue to develop their skills, their confidence and their expertise as research partners and leaders. So we've got a really uh, busy programme over the next two hours. We'll hear from colleagues from the AHRC, from RLUK and from ARMA. We'll also hear from colleagues working across the research library community in terms of what research means to them and why it's important for them and their institution to undertake research. And then towards the end of today's session, we'll explore the Research Catalyst cohort programme, including an opportunity for colleagues to ask any questions. And we'll give some more details about this in a moment. So today, and this wider programme really is there to celebrate, share and support. So before we begin, what is the Research Engagement Programme? What are we actually launching uh, today? So the Research Engagement Programme for Academic Libraries is a collaborative programme between Research Libraries UK, the AHRC and ARMA, the Association of Research Managers and Administrators. The Research Engagement Programme consists of three elements. Firstly, it consists of events and symposia, the first of which is today. These are open events which draw together colleagues from across the academic and the information sectors to share and showcase their experience of research partners and leaders. Some will be quite large events and quite generic, others will focus on certain areas of the research process, but they'll all be free to attend and openly available and advertised on the REK website. Secondly, the research engagement program will consist of case studies of emerging practice and library experiences of research leadership and collaboration. How can we contribute to the research process? What are some of the areas where we are, are leading? What are our experiences? Now, the REK website already has a number of case studies uh, published already, and we would welcome and have issued a call for case studies from across the academic library community from colleagues who are willing to share their experiences. So please do go to the REK website and see for further details if you'd like to submit a case study to this programme. And then finally, the third element, and the one that we'll talk a great deal about in the second half of today's session, is the Research Catalyst Cohort Programme. This is a step-by-step -step training programme to support colleagues working across the academic library community to develop up their research capacity and confidence, supporting them turning a research idea or research interest into a highly competitive research funding application. And we're delighted to be working in partnership with ARMA around the design and the delivery of this Research Catalyst cohort programme. But we'll say a bit more about that in a moment. But why are we doing this? What's the motivation for this? And what's the reason why these three organisations have come together? Well, a number of you may be aware that last year, RLUK and the AHRC undertook a major scoping study of the role and the potential role of academic libraries as research partners and leaders. It was very ambitious and it was delivered across a tight timescale and resulted in the publication of a major report in uh, late June, early July last year. And a link to the report is on screen and also in chat. This piece of research engaged with hundreds of colleagues right across the academic library, the academic, the funder and research manager uh, communities. And it highlighted and recommended 
that the AHRC, RLUK, AHRC and RLUK should work with like-minded stakeholders to support colleagues working across the academic library community to develop up their research capacity, confidence and expertise. And this programme is a part of that and is a direct reflection of those recommendations. And you can see the full report and the full recommendations online. I'm really thrilled to be speaking as our UK on this chat, our UK chair as on this platform with representatives from our programme partners, um, Alan Sudlow from the HRC and Jennifer Sturgeou from uh, Armour. And we'll come to both of those very shortly. Um, we are going to give some introductions from our uh, institutional perspectives uh, before we hear from um, our speakers spotlighting um, their experience of research in libraries. Um, and so at, actually, if you've got questions, then please do pop them in the chat, but we might not come back to them until we've heard from all of our panel speakers uh, in the second uh, part of this uh, this part of the program uh, today. So thanks everybody. I'm, I'm also hoping that you won't mind, even though I've firmly got my RLUK chair hat on, that I'm going to begin um, by talking a little bit about uh, a couple of stories from my own uh, life in libraries to kind of book, bookend my relationship to the topic uh, that we're, we're exploring today, because those kind of personal stories for me really speak to the value um, that I think is there in the significance of libraries in research and that framing of libraries as research labs that is at the heart of this program. Um, the first is at a really early stage of my career uh, when I worked at the Brotherton Library at Leeds University. A big shout out to anyone at Leeds University Libraries who are on the call here. Um, when I worked uh, cataloguing 20th century literary manuscripts um, in the Brotherton, in the special collections there. And that work rolled really seamlessly into what was then an Arts Humanities Research Board funded PhD. And took me more deeply, of course, into the research based on those literary papers that I'd been archiving and cataloguing as a paid employee of the library. And as I finished my PhD, I circled back into the library, working once more again on literary manuscripts for the same period, um, but extending the knowledge because I'd gained so much during that kind of doctoral time that aided me to, I, I hope, you know, put much more depth into those catalogue records to aid the future researcher scholars who had come after me. And even though each part of that time over a sort of five, six year period, I was wearing different hats. I had different job titles. I was paid in different ways uh, as a library assistant and as a doctoral student. In many ways, those identities were completely merged for me. Uh, each part of them were an ever deepening research and capturing of information and telling of stories for others to access and build on that made new knowledge and helped to codify that in ways that people could come back and do more with uh, making new knowledge, building on research. And so at the very start of my working life, there is this kind of virtuous circle, understanding the relationship between research and libraries and the knowledge of that work, often hidden, uh, is, is there um, as an intrinsic part of making research happen, sometimes participating, sometimes leading, sometimes facilitating. And then roll forward uh, over two decades uh, as I get greyer um, and imagine me in my first days in my current role at Cambridge University Library and I'm walking through and having inductions, my mind blowing with the, you know, the skill and quality of what I'm seeing to different staff and departments in the University Library. So here's me meeting someone in the conservation studio who is undertaking funded work uh, from the Wellcome Trust to investigate how to stabilise incredibly fragile inks and paper. Uh, that were used by prisoners in Second World War internment camps to record lives. And that is at the risk of absolute, um, you know, falling away. Uh, and, and she has had some, some, some funding to experiment and investigate how to stabilise that using skills as a scientist and as a heritage expert. Um, and then you, 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 you um, walk forward through the digital content unit where, frankly, magic is happening uh, and where experts in digital imaging um, and specialists in digital library and, and, and text encoding, sitting alongside research colleagues in digital humanities. And that work being a constant matrix of technical skill and research experiment around new questions that are raised to the possibility of, of the capabilities of that technology. And that space now, today, thanks to the HRC, is home to enhanced infrastructure to strengthen research in heritage science across libraries, archives and museums, thanks to CAPCO funding from the Arts Humanities Research Council. And then you walk on through special collections where, just to give you a flavour on any one day, you might meet an expert uh, specialising in, in um, description of Greek manuscripts, undertaking genuinely research quality cataloguing descriptions on which further research is placed, or research staff applying their knowledge uh, through one of our research units to um, 
the Geniza, one of the greatest Jewish medieval archives in the world. So looking at uh, their, their incredible language skills from Arabic to Hebrew uh, from the 10th century onwards uh, and all the linguistic change and cultural change that. Or talk to colleagues in our medical library uh, who are staff cited as authors on uh, clinical papers for the quality of their systematic review. And we could go on, and I know this is replicated across many spaces that are that are represented here. Everywhere you walk and weave, you get this really intrinsic understanding of the library as a lab. And that's the heart of what we are looking at, I think, through this program, the excitement and the passion that I think it has ignited. And that framing for me has become ever more urgent for our UK, for our researchers, for us uh, in research libraries through the pandemic, when so many of our scholars, particularly in the arts and humanities, although it's not, not exclusive to that, weren't able to spend time in spaces or alongside the collections or the people in a, uh, in a direct sense, who are such an important part of their research life and, and part of collaboration. And, and through that, you know, unexpectedly, there's been this renewal of our understanding of the research life that passes through research libraries and archives and museums, sometimes partnering, sometimes led by, sometimes facilitated by the great libraries of which so many of us here are part. And so for me, the development over the last 18 months, working closely with the HRC, uh, and particularly thanks to Tao here, uh, we have been able to help deepen our knowledge of the role of research libraries in the making and shaping and increasingly sharing of new knowledge. And that is, it's thrilling. You know, I love the connectivity across my own uh, library life, but seeing that kind of generated, renewed and genuinely maturing through the careers of those around me, uh, both at Cambridge and, and much more broadly through our UK, uh, the research libraries in our membership and beyond. So to get to this point today, when we're partnering with ARMA, uh, as so many of us do with our research offices in our own institutions. I think that's really great uh, as a combination of people. In order to help strengthen those ties, to in help increase recognition and the confidence, crucially, of our own staff and their development in the research process, however they touch that, this feels exactly what RLUK should be doing. Recognising, as our scholars have done for years, how intrinsically important libraries are to research and how the knowledge we have and the matrix of skills we can be in our spaces and virtually are to be nurtured to be developed, to be recognised. And that makes me truly excited to be launching today as our UK chair, the Research Engagement Programme, and to have this opportunity to do so with my partners, our partners, sorry, in the HRC and ARMA, so they too can share their insights from their own organisational perspectives about why this programme matters. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to Alan, who's going to talk uh, on behalf of the HRC. Alan. Thank you so much, Jess, and thank you for, what's well, clearly a passionate um, uh, piece from the heart, so I really appreciate it. Um, hello, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I officially started in my role at AHRC um, on Monday. Uh, so prior to that, I was um, head of research development at the British Library. Uh, I was at the library for 14 years. Um, so I've been really pleased to be asked to speak at this event because it's obviously very close to my heart. Um, the sorts of things that Jess had just outlined. And my previous role as head of research development for the library um, and today's event really echoed in that report. It's exactly in tune with my own experiences and the and awareness of the sector needs uh, from this time onwards, I think really. I think it's really crystallizes those very well. Um, I was fortunate enough to work with um, my team, colleagues across the library and partners, including RLUK, to build up a portfolio of externally funded research um, to support uh, the British Library's core purposes when I was in that role. Um, and some partners and, and ex-colleagues are on the call today. Um, I suppose I wanted to reflect on this in two ways and then talk about specifically in, in regards to my, my, my current role now at HRC, but just, just, just two points really. Um, a big part of our, our research endeavour was to build up a meaning portfolio of research practice that really fed into the library's core purposes. So it wasn't something different, it was really integrated into what we were doing as a library, which I think Jess has already sort of reflected on in a way. And that was also linked to um, gaining and maintaining our status as, a, as an independent research organisation or an IRO. That was just really one element of the journey. A real, really central component of it was raising research practice awareness, engagement and confidence 
with staff across all levels of the library. And that absolutely speaks to the aims, I think, of this research engagement program. So turning to the other hat, as it were, HRC um, was delighted to have partnered with RL UK um, on, on this program. And, and I believe that we've recently worked with RL UK to support um, professional practice fellowships for colleagues for, from research and academic libraries across the UK to develop their own research leadership skills. Um, and colleagues have told me that the breadth and excellence of the response to the call have enabled us to fund 10 fellowships to place colleagues um, across, across, the, across the sector um, with their research in a wider professionally, professional and disciplinary framework. Um, I, I really do hope this will equip the fellows with the research skills, knowledge and, and confidence to transform their professional practice through the research and also actually pass on their learnings to others across the sector. I think that's a really important thing for us to all be doing together on this. Um, highly complementary to those, that fellowship programme is what we're here for today, the broader research engagement programme, which is a very important piece of that jigsaw. I'm so pleased that the HRC is collaborating with RL UK on this and ARMA, I think, are, are the ideal partner to bring in that um, unique insight and professional, professional support in terms of how, how we can take this forward. Um, from what I've read, this looks like a unique a training program for library professionals in all aspects of research funding, development, and the whole life cycle, as it were. So I think that's fantastic. Um, not only I think is this a great approach to continue to build confidence and capacity across the library sector, but it also speaks explicitly to the UKRI vision of a research ecosystem that does not just mean the traditional academic route. It really is about all that expertise and talent beyond traditional academic posts that exist right throughout our library system. I think this also chimes with the technician's commitment and um, through AHRC, we want to better understand what that means to a community of professionals across the arts and humanities who, like myself when I was in role and many of my colleagues in the library would not identify as technicians, but would indeed be considered highly skilled professionals who are very much part of that greater research practice. Um, our work with RL UK is so important in this context, and I'm really pleased that we now have the professional insight and involvement at ARMA. And I think, as I said earlier, I think this is a perfect combination of this programme. So that's my very short intro. And with that, I'll hand over to Jennifer, Chair of ARMA. Thank you, Alan. Uh, thanks to Jess. Good morning, everybody. Uh, so yeah, I'm Jennifer Sturgio, Chair of um, ARMA UK, um, and also for the day job Director of the Research and Innovation Service at Northumbria. Um, and since we're on a bit of a theme, uh, I also started my research management career at Leeds. Uh, so I spent lots of time in the uh, in the Brotherton and was involved in uh, supporting applications to the uh, Welcome Trust for uh, special collections funded research um, that took place there as well. So uh, lots, uh, lots in common with the panel today, it seems. Um, so I thought I'd tell you all a little bit um, about ARMA as an organisation, because I recognise that not everyone on the call uh, may have come across us or, uh, or worked closely with us in the past. Um, so as the membership organisation for research managers and administrators, uh, we have approximately 3,000 members across the UK. They're mainly in universities and um, some independent research organisations, also some in funders, the NHS and, and other aligned organisations. Um, our membership is individual, it's not an institutional membership, um, so you can join as an individual regardless of what kind of organisation you might work with. Um, if your role involves supporting um, research or managing research in any, in any which way, um, then you're welcome as part of our community effectively. Um, the types of things that we, that we do and the services that we provide to our members, um, first of all start with community so um, we provide that opportunity for people to speak across institutions and across organizations about things that affect us at a sector level or things that affect them in their kind of day-to-day -day job but on an ongoing basis um, in particular to share practice across our special interest groups and the, the events that we run aligned to those um, we're very much about community and also very much about raising the voice of research managers within the sector 
Um, I think in the past, um, library colleagues may recognise this to an extent as well, but that there's been a feeling that uh, amongst research managers that professional staff are not necessarily always kind of recognised and valued in, in universities in, in the way that we should be. Um, and I've had colleagues quote things to me along the lines of feeling like second class citizens in a, in a university and so on. Um, and Alma are very keen, um, as I know UKRI are as well, as well with work that's been happening recently, to really um, change that perception, to raise the voice of research managers, to ensure we've got a, a parity of esteem between professional and academic colleagues. Um, and to take that huge expertise across the research management community and actually use that to um, to support the sector more broadly through, uh, through influencing policy, working with funders and other organisations to ensure that processes that are set up and the ways that things are done in different organisations across the sector actually um, are effective on the ground when it comes to actually undertaking research in universities. You know, this is the community of, the pe of people who um, actually interact with all of those policies, procedures, even systems and whatever else when, when it comes to the coal face. So there's a, a huge wealth of um, you know, really valuable and useful information and expertise there that can be provided. And that's increasingly, I think, being appreciated by funders, government departments and, and others in the, in the sector, uh, which, you know, which is excellent because that's something that's really important to us. Um, we also have a huge range of types of people um, and types of role within ARMA. Um, so research management will span from anything from uh, research development at the very early stage of developing ideas and thinking about foot, fit to fund the calls and thinking about how to have research funded um, to cost in projects, managing and delivering research. Um, supporting the, the research excellence framework, uh, supporting impact, support to scholarly comms, which is an area where we obviously work very closely with, uh, with library colleagues, um, and all the way through into IP and commercialization and dissemination type activities as well. And not all of our members, not all research managers are kind of purely research managers for their for their job they will do other jobs as well so we have a huge range of what we think of as kind of blended professionals so that might be people who are part research manager but also partly a researcher or partly on some other sort of contract in their university um, partly working in a research office partly working in a library for example uh, certainly I know we've got some ALMA members at the, at the library at Thumbria at my university um, and so it is a um, a kind of blended, complex, and for me, really exciting uh, kind of community of professionals that have a lot of different things to bring. Um, I mentioned scholarly comms. There are obviously lots of other areas where ARMA members and research officers already work very closely with their library colleagues. Um, and other examples that spring immediately to mind, as well as some of the funded research examples that we've already talked about, uh, training and support. Um, for researchers and support around bibliometrics and open access and uh, open research, the, the whole open science agenda. Um, so we're, we're communities that are working very closely together anyway. Um, and it seemed like a really kind of obvious and sensible fit to ARMA um, to work with RLUK and AHRC um, on this project. So we're really happy to be involved in the, in the collaboration. Um, I think research is ultimately, when it comes down to it, a people business. It thrives on collaboration and research management in that regard is, um, is no different. So, yeah, I think this is a, a really exciting programme. We're really happy to be involved. Thank you so much, Alan uh, and Jennifer. I'm now wondering why we haven't done an event with Armour before. We have so much in common. It's really wonderful to hear both of you speak um, across the different uh, kind of backgrounds of institutions, that, the organisations that you come from. And, uh, and Jenny, as you say, just, just the number of kind of inter interactions between um, our different communities. Uh, but running through, I hope what all of us have said is this, is this really strong sense that, you know, uh, recognition, building confidence. We're all in the business of making great research and great impact for research for society. Uh, and so making sure that people have got the, the skills, the confidence and the backing to do that uh, as part of the kind of the overall um, process and, and making of new knowledge uh, is what we're here to do. And, and, and I think we are, even since when we did the scoping study for the HRC, um, that, that I see that already maturing. Um, and Alan's quite right to mention the uh, the practice fellowships, the HRC practice fellowships, because I think those are such a good sign and have been such a good uh, intervention uh, to give people a message that um, 
this is not all words this is actually about action and doing things which this program is also in terms of developing um giving that development opportunity to to a cohort of which will be 18 uh, as we go through it as well as what's available to everybody so we are right on time this never happens uh, we're right on time for this bit and i am responsible for chairing our next section so with a huge thank you to alan uh, and to jennifer i'm now going to move to a spotlight on presentations and discussions uh, about the meaning of research um, through research life with case studies and a panel discussion. And if you've got questions that you want to pose for, for Jennifer or for Alan, um, then please do put them in the chat. And if we've got time, we'll come back to them through, through the end of this panel section too. Uh, it's in really intended to be informal and a conversation. Uh, and as Jennifer says, you know, we're in the people business, all of us. So let's feel that we can talk and use this time uh, to, to the best for all of us. So I'm really delighted uh, to have the opportunity uh, to hear now short presentations um, from four colleagues uh, within the RLUK community, but more broadly from the research library community, all with an incredible knowledge uh, of research and collections in their own institutions and much more broadly. And they're going to be talking um, aspects about uh, what's important, about uh, why your library conducts research in its own right, and what contribution that makes to the overall uh, goals of the organisations in which they sit and to the goals around research uh, in general. And we're going to hear uh, from each of them about five or six five, six, seven minutes, and then we'll come back to plenary uh, to, to have that kind of conversation, kicking off with a few questions to each of them first. So use the chat uh, to put in your questions. And we're going to hear first um, from uh, Judy Berg, who's head of collections um, at the University of Durham. And um, Judy, I think um, that when you're ready, I'll then just in introduce John following up. So over to you. Share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that okay? Uh, we, we can, Judy, it's all there. Okay, perfect, thank you. Uh, let's just, there we go. Um, so I'm presenting mainly on behalf of Craig um, Barclay, who's our head of museums, galleries and exhibitions, but I'll have some personal comments as well. Um, and unfortunately he's not able to be here today, but I'm very pleased to kind of uh, present a case study on his behalf. And just to give you a quick bit of context, there's lots of different collection areas within library and collections at Durham. We all have different um, experiences of research. It different, differs between our collection areas, but we all undertake research to a certain extent. And um, I think we're, that museums particularly are very heavily engaged in research. They're very often uh, requested to be co-eyes um, in research to the extent that it almost squeezes out their curatorial work sometimes. And we've ha actually had to recruit a new person in museums to help the curatorial work. And we aspire to that level of, of involvement within archives and special collections. And I echo your comments, Jess, about the magic of digital and heritage science and the contribution that the CAPCO funding has made to that. There's some really exciting developments that we're, that we're taking advantage of in that area, which is hugely exciting. So the case studies um, involving staff at the Oriental Museum uh, relate to the Marshall Collection. Um, he was uh, Director General of Archaeological Survey of India, um, and there's a huge set of photographs taken in the first half of the last century, which I'm sure you can imagine are a, a fantastic research resource. The university acquired the collection in the 1950s, and it's been central to lots of research projects since then. Just to give you an idea of the kind of material that there is in his collection and, and how interesting it is. So there's two ways in which um, uh, museum staff have been involved in significant research projects relating to this collection. The first is Walking with the Buddha, a major research project um, in Nepal. Um, we have within Durham the UNESCO Chair of World Heritage uh, Sites uh, in the Department of the Archaeology and, and he researches all around the world and, and clearly given the Oriental Museum's collections, they're involved um, in co-creating and, and joining in his, a lot of his research. And uh, staff and collections were essential to this um, Walking the Buddha project. Um, and as part of the research dissemination for the project, there was um, an exhibition um, in Nepal, which was co-created and co-developed um, and the venue for the exhibition um, was in Taiwan. Uh, and it was, as I said, 
it co-curated um, heavily involving Oriental Museum staff. Um, there were curation workshops um, in Durham and in Taiwan. This was back in the days when we could travel and do this kind of thing. Um, and uh, the museum, in, the exhibition included early Buddhist sculpture from the Oriental Museum and lots of images from the Marshall Collection. And the exhibition attracted almost a million visitors. So in terms of research impact, a fantastic case study. Uh, the, they also were involved in the editorial team of a, of a multilingual exhibition catalogue and contributed to um, academic conferences that accompanied um, that catalogue um, and the research dissemination. The second uh, project involving the Marshall Collection uh, related to the World Heritage Site at Taxila in Pakistan. This was a collaboration between the Oriental Museum, again, Department of Archaeology and the Department of Archaeology in Pakistan. And again, it was dual, linguish, uh, dual language, um, English and Urdu, and it was supported by other research institutes um, within Durham and also funded partly by AHRC. And this project arose um, in the wake of a Durham Residential Research Library Fellowship. We have a scheme where we um, fund researchers from the UK and around the world to come to Durham to, to use our collections for between a month and three months with the idea that that develops um, national and international research collaborations, which it definitely did in this case. It's a very good uh, example. And museum staff were involved right at the beginning of planning that, that fellows research. And they co-developed both a physical and a digital exhibition. Um, and a key strand of the project was understanding the, the conservation challenges of World Heritage Sites. And obviously Durham has, a, it's, we have our own World Heritage Site. So this research in terms of conservation globally of, of conservation of World Heritage Sites is very important to us. Um, and you can, understand the importance of the Marshall Collection in, in helping this research. Just to give you a couple of examples of images taken about 100 years apart, so you can see the, the impact um, of the collection on the research. And um, there's another one. So some thoughts from Craig and from myself about what research means to us as individuals and institutions and communities of practice. And particularly, I think for the museum staff at, at Durham, it's a huge opportunity to engage in and to contribute to international research that, that's really cutting edge. It's an important facet of our professional lives. And again, I'm really thing I'd like to stress, particularly for the museums team, they are heavily involved in teaching as well. They, they teach entire modules um, and assessment. And the, the idea of research-led teaching, I think, should extend to, to um, curatorial professionals and library professionals, as well as academics. And it's part of that parity of esteem as well, we've talked about before. And, and the idea of, of the curators as another discipline. Um, it enhances the profile of the institution. That's obvious from what I've said, I think. And it also allows the museum staff to support other institutions that might not have that specialist curatorial um, knowledge and skills. And it, it underpins everything that we do. It enables understanding of the collections. And I think particularly it's at the heart of the concept of designated collections that we have at Durham and our stewardship of them. I hope I've done that within my time, bit of a race through. <laughs> Beautifully done, Judy. Thank you so much. Uh, and much as I'd like to stop and, and ask you questions immediately, we're going to move on uh, so we can hear from everyone. Uh, and I'm delighted to introduce next up uh, John Hodson, who is the Associate Director of Curatorial Practices at the University of Manchester Library. And John, I'm going to hand straight over to you. Thanks, Jess. Hopefully you can see my slides. Um, I was asked, first of all, to consider what conducting research brings to me personally, my institution and communities of practice. So for myself, I studied for a PhD part time between 2012 and 2017. I was investigating the Bibliotheca Lindesiana. This is the library of the Earls of Crawford, uh, great manuscript collectors in the 19th century, and their collection is now at the Rylands. 
So the motivation for undertaking a PhD didn't really derive from any desire to move into an academic role um, or indeed uh, an ambition to advance my career within libraries and archives. It was rather the intrinsic interest in the subject itself. However, it would be disingenuous to suggest that I was totally unaware of the professional benefits that a PhD uh, has within academic libraries. So on a practical basis, the research directly supported uh, my curatorial role as it was then. It enhanced my understanding of the manuscripts and their provenance, helped me to support researchers on the collection. Uh, obtaining a PhD also uh, enhanced my own self-esteem and confidence, and it increased my educational and cultural capital. So for better or for worse, I was accorded uh, greater respect from academics for having a PhD. I'd basically joined their club. Since 2017, I've tried to remain research active, and I've published a couple of uh, articles in high-ranked academic journals rather than in professional or library history journals, but an expanding day job has prevented me from developing my research further and ultimately publishing a monograph. In my case, I can't speak for everyone, but in my case, being a senior library manager just hasn't been conducive to, to remaining research active. I simply haven't got the time and headspace, but maybe other people don't have that same challenge. For my institution, the University of Manchester Library, conducting research has been an intrinsic part of what we do. In 2013, we set up the John Wylands Research Institute to catalyze research on our special collections and inject new life into them. And last year, we took a further step in formally merging the August John Wylands Library and the Institute to produce this rather long-winded John Rylands Research Institute and Library, or Rylands for short. One of our key objectives is to blur the distinctions between library staff and researchers. We're encouraging the former to become more research active and inculcating uh, curatorial practices and mentalities amongst our research colleagues. So examples of the first include several library staff undertaking PhDs currently, library staff acting as co-eyes in research projects, but not as yet PIs. Um, as at Cambridge and Durham, advanced imaging specialists and conservators working alongside researchers developing new techniques to interrogate materials in novel ways. And uh, an advanced, uh, a brilliant public engagement with research team collaborating with researchers to develop novel impact case studies. For their part, academic researchers work alongside imaging specialists and conservators to investigate the collections using cutting edge scientific techniques. They curate exhibitions, they create TI transcriptions and advanced metadata. We also employ academics to catalogue specialist materials as at Cambridge, such as the Hebrew, Persian and Latin manuscripts, where specialist skills are required. Now, arguably major libraries have always done this, but the difference now, certainly at Manchester, is that there is a deliberate effort to foster knowledge exchange and develop a community of practice between these specialists and other library staff from a position of parity and mutual respect. The John Wines Research Institute and Library has also brought um, many material benefits. So we've been very successful in grant capture as a result of the partnership. Uh, in the last academic year, there were new or ongoing research grants and contracts worth six million brought in by Institute staff and University of Manchester research researchers who had received pilot or early career uh, awards from the Institute. These awards came from the AHRC, the ESRC, Leverhulme and Wellcome. And as elsewhere, we also received practical support as library staff from um, those brilliant research managers that Jennifer represents, uh, grant writers, experts in full economic costing. 
Uh, the other question um, I'm considering is why is it important? I mean, it should be self-evident, of course. And I think um, it's a false question. Why is it important that my library conducts research in its own right? Um, the library and the research institute are just inextricably interwoven. The Rylands is a genuine community of scholars and library specialists where these distinctions are blurred. But in the spirit of the event, I'll, I'll endeavor to answer the question. So library uh, staff are experts in many fields, but I think the intersection between professional practice and the creation of new knowledge is a really exciting zone to inhabit. So obvious examples from special collections, I've listed out the history and ethics of collecting, the history of libraries and other sites of knowledge formation, inclusive curation practice, practices, as we've heard from Durham, and the development of advanced imaging and conservation technologies and methodologies, uh, investigations in material science, and that whole nebulous world of digital humanities. And this is before we consider the wider library uh, with experts in many fields, including bibliometrics, um, data analysis, programming, AI, etc. So we have leaders in all of these fields who are actively publishing and uh, promulgating their work. And it's clear that the creation of new knowledge in these fields is increasingly being recognized as legitimate research in its own right, not before time. Until recently, cataloging hasn't really been considered as a research activity in itself, merely as a facilitator of research. So we haven't been able to include it in funding bids, except in very circumscribed ways. Of course, we, we need to develop uh, a robust definition of what constitutes research like cataloging. There has to be quality thresholds similar to the criteria used to assess the quality of research, for example. So in summary, the, the benefits to the library are manifold. Uh, enhanced status of the library and its staff, closer integration with our academic colleagues, certainly improved morale and self-esteem amongst our staff and having those relationships, developing those relationships with academic colleagues, much greater focus on the collections, improvements in cataloging and resource discovery. I could go on, but ultimately the, the benefit is the creation of new knowledge. I will stop there. Thank you so much, John. Right on time. Uh, and I love that kind of observation about the, the intersection between professional practice and the making of new knowledge and the particular uh, space that creates for innovation. If you create confidence for people to give of their different experiences within that within that, in, uh, within that space. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm now going to bring in uh, Owen Roberts, who is the Director of Collections and Public Programmes and Deputy, Deputy Chief Executive and Librarian at the National Library of Wales. Owen, it's great to have you with us. There we are. Well, a very good morning, uh, and it's a lovely morning here uh, in Aberystwyth. Um, I, I will do my best to keep to time. The other two speakers have done very well, so the bar has been set. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Ariel Kay for the opportunity uh, to speak at this event. Um, it's been a, a very, very stimulating um, event so far. Um, the, the formidable question that was postulated what was does research mean uh, within NLW and that's a question that possibly could take more than five minutes to answer but I'll start off with a little bit of context um, I, I won't um, I won't read out this slide but the main point uh, I'm making in terms of the National Library the National Library of Wales uh, is is more than books it's more than published collections um, and we have extensive collections in multiple uh, formats. Uh, and that, as a result, um, it is a place where you have content, when you have skills, and you have connections. Uh, and that's ultimately what makes a library and all the other research libraries, I think, represented here, uh, a vital part uh, of research and cultural infrastructure. Um, we don't have uh, IRO status, uh, and that, that sometimes can be uh, a challenge in terms of how we, we integrate into, into the research system. 
But I think when you look at the, the overall um, contribution, I think it's very positive that the report talks about sort of collection holding institutions specifically. So what, what I'm going to do in, in, the, in these few minutes is just present you uh, with maybe just a little bit of a strategic context and then finish off with a really, really, really granular, granular example so that we get sort of look, look at it from both ends uh, of the telescope, if you like. So from a sort of strategic context, uh, we just launched our new strategic plan uh, back in November. Uh, and our planning uh, is done in the context of the Wellbeing of the Future Generations Act. So we, we have our, uh, our vision, which is an uh, institutional vision, but what we're working towards is set out in the sort of broader context of the act that we have a duty to sort of satisfy and, and to be able to contribute to. And they contribute specifically to those well well-being goals that you see in colorful rainbow colored uh, pictures. And what do you see that we're mapping uh, the strategic well-being objectives of the organization to those? And that gives us sort of a, a line of sight, if you like, towards why we're undertaking um, the work that we're doing. Now, research is mentioned, you'll notice on the fourth objective. Um, but obviously, uh, as been already uh, been remarked, uh, research is something that pervades every aspect of the work uh, of our organizations. Uh, and if you look across the sort of those four sort of strategic well-being objectives, we've already heard around sort of how we cultivate and care for, for the nation's memory. That's inherent in there. How we lay the foundation for knowledge economy and the role of engaging with sort of the creative sector has a specific uh, part to play. And we're not going to be able to be at the heart of national life unless we have uh, the research behind it. And then... Below those sort of organizational objectives, we do have specific research priorities, which just may help us maybe to refine uh, a little bit more of how we prioritize different partnerships. Um, so we have an element around interpreting and reinterpreting collections, and that obviously has a, a very important focus. And the EDI focus, um, uh, especially over the last few years, as we see how, how we uh, how we develop our work in that area. Then in the middle, you have uh, the impact uh, and the development of digital collections uh, in the context of new technologies. And this again uh, is reflected widely across the community from digital scholarship network to the digital shift agenda. So that's something that's very, very pertinent. And then we have um, the third, which is around methodologies uh, and professional practice. Uh, uh, and again, this just uh, emphasizes really the importance of the, the multi-layered and, and that really, really deep foundations that underlies a lot of this research work. Um, the, special, the different specialisms that you need to be able uh, to assemble to, to, to deliver uh, and, and to deliver on, on the impact that you're looking for. So that's a, sort of a, a, an organizational view. Um, just developing that a little bit forward, I think that the word impact has already been mentioned. Um, and one of the things that we've been doing in this sort of planning framework is looking at how we work impact into, into the planning. Um, and I, I can, I, at an organizational uh, level, we have um, these um, key uh, sort of outcomes that we're looking for uh, in all the activity that we undertake. Um, and um, I won't go through all of them uh, in the time that I have, but obviously when we're taking uh, uh, and looking our, our, at our research activity, what we're looking is how we can maximize uh, each of these uh, goals or outcomes within, within that program. And then I, I said that I would finish with a really, really specific and a really granular example, but, but I think it was, I, I was, pondering and thinking, what am I going to pick? There's so many things. Uh, I, I was going on, on the walk with Jess at the beginning of the, the, the program through my own own organization and thinking about the different departments, the different contributions that are made um, from preservation, um, from curatorial, from, from the digital aspects. And I tried to pick something that was quite specifically that really wouldn't have been possible without, uh, without what we have. So effectively, what we have is 
the combination of different projects. They, they happen to be digitization projects, but that's just a, an example. On the bottom, bottom left-hand side, you have the Welsh Book of Remembrance, which is an item that was digitized um, um, and it contains 40,000 names. Um, it was digitized by NLW. It was a project to use 150 volunteers to transcribe the, the names uh, of the fallen from Wales who served uh, in the First World War. Um, then we have the Cardiganshire Military Tribunal records, which are down at the bottom. These are also digitized as part of another project. Again, uh, there was a volunteer input. And then at the top right hand side, we have the Welsh newspapers online. They're all projects, they're all collections that have come from different, uh, different eras um, uh, or different sort of eras in terms of digitization. But together, they tell a story. And the story I want to finish with, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a poignant story, but it just um, shows that we have uh, this individual, uh, John Emrys Ladd, who, who's in the Welsh Book of Remembrance. Um, and what we found uh, as we were passing the data, we found the records for his appeal against conscription. Um, we were able to link that together and then link that all the way up to uh, the report when his appeal was dismissed uh, in the newspaper uh, collection. Um, so that's a really, really granular, a really, but, but this all revealing that story wouldn't have been possible without those unique combinations uh, of, uh, of skills, uh, of research uh, and of endeavor and sweat and hard work. Uh, and that's where I, I wanted to finish really uh, and emphasize the point that research libraries are really, they are living infrastructures uh, and they combine many things. It's around content, it's about skills and it's about connections. And I'm going to leave it there. And apologies, I think I've marginally gone over my time. It was all good. It was all good, Owen. And, and we wouldn't have missed a second. So so please don't think twice about that. Um, and, and I really enjoyed that framing from uh, the overall strategic to, you know, these are the individual lives that we're surfacing and making real um, uh, for, I mean, the world, but also for the Welsh community and the pride and nationhood that is there. So thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, I'm now going to come to our last speaker in this, in this session, and then we will have time. For, uh, I'm gonna, I've got a couple of questions for the panel members, but we'll also be picking up in others that, that come through the chat. Um, and I'd like to therefore turn to Fiona Courage, who is the Associate Director for um, at the Library uh, at the University of Sussex, and also the Director of Mass Observation Archive, Fiona. Thank you very much, Jess. Um, and um, thank you to the previous three speakers, because I think you've kind of framed beautifully what I'm going to end with, um, which is very much a personal reflection, I think, which incorporates much of what you have been um, uh, showcasing in terms of the activity that goes on in your institutions and I think as befits somebody who's worked with the Mass Observation Archive for 20 years now, over 20 years, um, I'm going to give you a micro observation I think about uh, research and research at Sussex. So briefly Sussex is a much smaller institution I think in terms of um, it's the, the size of the library, the size of uh, the, the research that we undertake and the size of the collections although I will say maybe not the quality of the collections because we do have at least one designated collection that we hold which is mass observation um, and therefore I think the approach is probably slightly different what I want to do is just reflect um, over the last 20-25 years that I've been at Sussex in terms of what research has meant for us as a library and I'm taking the library as the institution when I'm talking here rather than Sussex as, as a university and in the copious notes that I've got and I've got lots of paper because I'm a librarian who's worked with archives for years in the copious notes I've got here the one word that kept coming through was evolution and um, as I thought about these questions, I thought what I've been seeing is a complete evolution in terms of how is we as librarians interact with researchers, but also with research. And when I started off working um, in special collections uh, in 2000, I was very much, my role was as a supporter. It was as a facilitator. It was as somebody who brought the boxes out for the researchers to look through. 
Um, and what I've seen over the years is an evolution in which the recognition has been, oh, well, you know about these collections, don't you? And then it's actually about interpreting those collections and that the value of our interpretation is worthwhile. So this led me on a slightly similar um, journey to John in that I decided I wanted to do a doctorate. In my case, it was because I wanted to understand what it was my academic colleagues were talking about when they talked in research language. And actually what it did was completely revolutionize the way that I approached research and working with them. Um, and as a result, I think had um, enabled me to lead in research in ways that I hadn't done before in research projects as an equal partner. Now, I'm not suggesting that all of my colleagues have to go off and do doctorates in order to get that. But what it has enabled me to do is to be much clearer when I am supporting them in research work that they may want to be able to do um, or that they will participate in. And it's not just obviously about me, it's about us as a, as a whole workforce and how um, this recognition is going across the board with our staff, particularly with the rise in digital humanities. And um, at Sussex, the Sussex Humanities Lab was set up uh, about five or six years ago with the library as an integral part of it. And it was really important to them that we were not simply service providers, that we weren't just about infrastructure, we were actually part of that research in there. Um, and, and I think that's where the evolution has continued, because what I have seen is the projects that we've participated on have sort of, although they're still collections based, they're actually beginning to become more um, more social science-y than humanities, I guess. Um, and I'm seeing uh, much more involvement in um, user experience, for example, the anthropology of libraries, the development of spaces, the psychological behavior um, of students within those spaces. And suddenly we are working with researchers on that because we want to know about it. So um, the, the sort of the, the, the dynamics, I think, of our interaction with research has evolved from us, you know, sort of supporting research to us needing research in order to provide those services and develop and evolve those services as well. Um, I think I've said the word evolution enough. Um, I haven't covered many of the notes that I have written, many of the copious notes, but I am aware of the time as well, and I, it would be really good to leave some time for discussion. So I'm going to um, call it there. Well, that's you. very, very generous of you, Fiona, but a, a lovely um, kind of weaving through uh, your own kind of research relationships, your research institution uh, and your research life. And I'm really taken the way actually almost everyone this morning has spoken in a way that has touched on their own relationship as an individual to uh, the processes and, and involvement in research and how strongly, therefore, the, the motivations for us between the missions of the organisations in which we inhabit, the mission of research and our own kind of personal kind of sense of kind of career satisfaction faction and recognition uh, are, 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 are touched on by the topics which we're speaking on and that's a that's a very good place to be if you can line up those different energies uh, to kind of great outcomes so thank you to everyone um, including on the first panel from ARMA and AHRC uh, as well for this for this we now have a, a few minutes for questions about 10 minutes and then everyone gets a break uh, so uh, for five minutes before we sort of turn into the next section, um, we've got a couple of questions that are coming in now, but I'd like to start with a general one, if I may, um, to our speakers, to our four speakers. Um, and that's really, um, it's a question of kind of definition, really, that you've all touched on uh, in different ways. Um, around, do you see a difference, and I'm happy whoever wants to come in on this, in how the term research is applied within academic libraries? and how it is used and applied by members of the, I guess, more strictly defined academic community. I guess we're looking for kind of some of those judgments around uh, about value and definition. And, and I don't know if anyone want, any of our speakers wants to put their hand up and, and, um, and find, and actually that does pick up on a question from Alex Franklin in the chat, which is about uh, different examples of research library, uh, research language to some extent. Anyone willing to, to go first? I can see that Judy's unmuted, but that might be, Judy, are you willing to come in? Yeah, uh, it's a, a discussion I had with Craig um, thinking about that question. And, and one of the things that, that we considered is, is that research in, in libraries and museums and archives sometimes just kind of makes that leap straight to impact. So it's not necessarily 
scholarly research as, as you might define it. And it's not doesn't necessarily lead to a conference paper or a scholarly article or citation, but it quite often leapfrogs to the next stage of, of impact that, that increasingly research is, is encouraged to define its impact on society and professional practice. Uh, and because it's embedded in professional practice, it, it just has that different focus and possibly different audiences. But it's, it's still very much that, you know, developing knowledge. Uh, I tend to come in, but I'm going to come straight to Fiona, who's got a hand up. Sorry, well, I feel that I should uh, also, as, as Alex has asked, um, and, and kind of building on what you say there, Judy, I think that the, the impact is really interesting because the, the research language that I discovered when I was working as a researcher was very much on what your research question is. And um, I remember in my cohort of other doctoral students going with my very practical research question and they just didn't get it. They didn't get, well, you know, how do you put that into a methodological framework of understanding? And I was thinking, yeah, no, but I just want a solution. I want a solution to this problem. So from that point of view, the sort of um, being able to interpret those research languages so that when you work with researchers to enable them to get what they need out of it as well, it's really, really important. I think that's that's fascinating. And I'm, I'm minded that we work with all the disciplines that uh, that, that uh, appear in our universities. And we might have a different conversation about the kind of research questions we're asking if we're talking with a, a social scientist or with an engineer uh, or those who work in an applied space to those who who, who work in a more abstract space. And, 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 and it isn't just a translation, is it, between library and the academic community. The academic community is multiple and diverse uh, and, and the language uh, shifts depending on the different sub-community, sub-discipline, research group you're speaking in. Um, I'm just going to see John if he wants to come in. Thank you, John. That's great. Just a very quick comment to add to that. I think one of the things that libraries are very good at is facilitating interdisciplinarity and um, rather than simply allowing, giving, giving space for researchers from STEM subjects and the humanities to have those conversations, we should be actually at the heart of those conversations and actively bringing those people together. Um, I think that, that, that whole interdisciplinarity is, is an area where I think we can really take advantage because we, we just, it's our natural way of working. I love that, John. Um, the, the, the act of continual translation and collaboration are, are actually fundamental, um, I'm gonna say values or behaviors at the heart of, of what our professional practice is. Owen. Uh, I, I totally agree. And it's about how uh, the library uh, and in, in many guises can, can give that different or additional perspective to, to what, what, what's being studied and what, what's under discussion, I think. And it's, it's that multiplicity of perspectives that really sort of strengthens the, the whole process and, uh, and the outcomes that you get. Thank you so much. And I, I'm going to go now to some of the questions which are in uh, the chat. Um, and there's one that was stimulated by Owen's uh, presentation and one by Judy's, but anyone can come into these. And um, I'm going to sort of precy um, the, the one uh, that was stimulated by, by Owen, your, uh, your um, presentation about the, uh, the archive um, connectivity of the, of the, of the Welsh uh, and military kind of archives uh, towards the end of your presentation. I think the question is how, how far you saw that as a kind of an aspect that as citizen science and, and and maybe the broader question that, that comes from that is is to what extent are each of you uh, seeing or shaping deliberately that that kind of emergence or evolution uh, uh, to use uh, the word that's come up a lot of the modes of research participation consciously through uh, how you're shaping kind of research programs and I wonder if I come to Owen first uh, given that's where the question began. Yeah there we are, um, th thanks for the question uh, Liam. I, I think the terminology around these kinds of projects are really, really interesting because so, obviously we have a crowdsourcing system that allows us to do work, which is a mass sort of participation project. Um, and we have a volunteer program, which, which sits uh, inside the organization uh, and where you have people physically coming to the building to work on collections. Uh, and it's really interesting how, uh, how you label things uh, maybe uh, gives people different uh, opinions as to what, what it entails and how they engage with it. 
Um, as to the point of, around volunteering, citizen science, crowdsourcing, what, what we found and what, what I realized quite quickly was that really it's a continuum of engagement. And I've talked about this before, where you have, you know, um, in our volunteer pro project, for example, you will have a, a really specific task, something, a, a handful of people working on, on a collection. Right on the other end of the spectrum, then you have sort of that sort of citizen science, your um, your, your proper sort of crowdsourcing, um, you know, where you have thousands and tens of thousands of people contributing. And then in the middle there, you, you uh, and what we're increasingly finding is that you have this sort of digital volunteering space in the middle as well, which you could pr probably talk about citizen science. And I suppose it runs in parallel will, with that whole discussions around, you know, digital and physical and that sort of hybrid nature of, of the world that we're working in. Um, but, but what you find that a lot of the work that we're doing is, is, is moving towards that sort of digital volunteering where, where you're getting quite often getting people in a room to work on things that they have uh, interesting conversations around those, but they're using and they're enhancing their digital skills. So, so there's lots of interesting things going on, I think, in this space around sort of digital engagement and, and that sort of continuum and how that sort of feeds in to then to different audiences as well. That was a really long answer to, to, to a simple question. But, it's a great uh, answer. My it's thoughts. a great answer. <laughs> Thank you, Owen. Uh, and I can see Judy has unmuted. Is that suggesting you'd like to come in, Judy? You'd be very welcome to on this point. No, I don't think I've got anything to add to that. It was an excellent answer, other than agreeing with it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Owen. Let me just um, explore the other one of the other questions that come up that was stimulated by what Judy uh, put forward. Um, and that was really asking um, Judy if perhaps you might kick off, uh, I'm sure other panellists want to come in, of, of what you see as the kind of the opportunity and challenges and, and perhaps the relationship between uh, research and research led teaching, uh, which I know has been a, a, an increasing part of the, um, I think I'm Keep using is it Fiona's word evolution of the role of libraries in research uh, 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 over the last 20 years plus Judy what do you yeah, see I think there? I think it's a really interesting dynamic between research and teaching and uh, in terms of uh, library staff and again the evolution on both counts and uh, there is there seems certainly at Durham I think there is a difference between museums and and archives and special collections in this regard and I think in other universities there, there are some situations where museum curators are embedded within academic departments. So their status and, and the, the expectations and their role is, is very, very different. In Durham, it's kind of a halfway house. I think there's a lot of conservators in the archeology span department in particularly at Durham. So there's a lot of synergies between the archeology span curriculum and also museums, languages and cultures curriculum and the collections, particularly in Oriental Museum and archeology. span So they are really heavily embedded in teaching delivery design and delivery of teaching and an assessment of entire modules as I said to the extent to which that their curatorial work gets squeezed out um, that isn't the case so much with archives and special collections and I think there's um there's research led teaching and there's almost teaching as a way into research collaboration so I'm very keen that and we're starting to do this to sort of engage much more with curriculum development to encourage the development of modules specifically relating to archives and special collections teaching. And through that route, um, in, in, you know, encourage um, conversations about research programs and research development. So it's, 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 there's a dynamic between the two areas. And I think it is, it is a challenge, um, but I think approaching the two together in parallel and really thinking, when I started my career, the, the library staff were called academic related. Some other people will remember that term and it, and, it, and it kind of seemed to fade into the background, which I think was a great shame. But thinking of ourselves as academic related staff and, and having that as a mindset for, for curriculum and research development, I think is, is one way of approaching it. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to take a, a comment from John and then um, I'm going to encourage people to carry on having that conversation in the chat because we are going to move to a break for five minutes in order to go into the next section. John. Yeah, there's been a total transformation in the last 20 years in how we've done teaching. So we used to be regarded as the pretty or not so pretty assistants, the dumb handlers of material and the academics were the experts. It's very much now about team teaching and we are accorded equal respect both for our um, subject expertise but also because of our technical skills working alongside academic colleagues and we are 
developing some really, really exciting proposals for um, the next 18 months where the library will be at the very heart of MA teaching programmes, um, bringing those research skills to, to, to the student experience. Sorry, thank you so much, John. I'm, I'm aware we're just warming up in the chat, uh, but I'm, go I'm going to move us on slightly. Um, I wonder if, if, is Jennifer still with us from Armour? Uh, there she is, Jennifer. Uh, there's a comment in the chat, which I wonder if I might just give the final word to you for this section, because uh, we're so pleased to be working with Armour um, uh, for this programme. Uh, there's a question that says, uh, great how Armour involved. It strikes me that members could be a great catalyst in connecting academics with research. The Armour members could be a great catalyst for connecting academics with research library professions. And certainly there is that kind of, you know, all the question of, of, you know, there's lots of relationships that build up over time through teaching relationships and other things, but actually that structurally doesn't necessarily mean that you're the, the right people are always meeting the right people they're meeting the same people again and again yeah. uh, and so the kind of question is you know is there a role for armor in helping with that kind of uh, creating that interconnectivity and in introductions yeah i mean i think there's potentially a, um, a role at two levels so at a, at a more strategic level i was really pleased to receive um, an email from rl uk recently by armor capacity about your new strategy and we were about to send you one about our new strategy and say let's sit down and have a conversation about where we need to do more together across these two, two uh, new strategic plans. But on a more practical level within organisations, generally it's the research development teams in particular within research officers who have fingers in all the pies and know about all the different research that's going on and all the different people and whose role it is to, to connect people effectively. And research development managers kind of automatically think about doing that with different groups of academics you know hey you engineers what if we put some social scientists or whatever else into your project but actually um, making the case to research development managers that they ought to be thinking about library colleagues as well when they're thinking about those connections potentially um, you know probably could be actually a really effective way of starting to join people up um, so that's probably something else we can think about in terms of what could ARMA communicate to our members about the types of areas and the types of research that library colleagues would be um, well placed to support with or to be actively involved in? Thank you so much, Jennifer, and thank you so much for each of our speakers, to, to Judy, to John, to Owen and to Fiona. I think that's been such a rich panel and, and you'll see when you have a chance to kind of look up uh, or look down at the chat, there are, there are questions and comments still coming in. But um, I am going to be a good chair for this session and make sure we all get a break before we move into the final of the final stretch. And, and, and but, but, you know, keep the questions coming. And I, and I think that we're used to now on Zoom, aren't we, answering things in that format and, you know, where there isn't time to answer them, then uh, just as Jennifer is kind of queued up. Um, some of this will provide us with kind of uh, substance for areas which we might want to dig into a little bit more deeply as we frame the programme uh, overall. So thank you to um, Jess, uh, to Jennifer and to Alan and all our speakers uh, for the first two parts of uh, today's uh, session. We really do appreciate the all the comments and the experiences that have been shared and they really frame, I think, uh, what we'll be discussing in this section really well. So in the next uh, 35 minutes or so, we'll be talking through the third element of the research engagement programme, which is the Re Research Catalyst Cohort programme. I'm aware there are a lot of programmes in this, maybe that's a, a reflection for, for future years, is to vary, uh, vary the terminology. But what we'll do is um, I'll very briefly provide an overview uh, quickly of some of the key programme elements. We've already talked about the context of where this has come from. So I'll talk through some of the mechanics, uh, eligibility, uh, what the programme will consist of, and some of the key dates for the diary in terms of the application process and things to consider. And then the majority of our time will be dedicated to questions. Uh, and uh, my two colleagues at Arma, Hamish and Eva, will be joining me um, to offer any uh, uh, responses to questions if you have them. So in terms of just providing you an overview of what this programme is, and I should say that these details are available on the RE UK website, um, so you can see those uh, by following the, the links shared earlier in chat. The Research Catalyst Cohort Programme is really here to provide a very tailored and bespoke training programme to a cohort of academic library colleagues who are interested in turning an area of research interest um, an, uh, an area of, of uh, research which relates to their, their professional practice or a research question that they have, and to turn this into a highly competitive academic funding application. 
how can we uh, as colleagues turn these areas of interest into actual applications into research funders. Now I should say that research funders include the AHRC and include the wider UKRI family, but the programme will be exploring more generally how to put applications into a wider range of academic funders, which can include um, institutions like Neverhume, for example, the British Academy and Wellcome. So this will be around quite generically around putting in applications to research funders and won't just be about putting applications into the AHRC. It will be delivered on a train the trainer model, um, which means that there's a real emphasis on you sharing the learning that you acquire through this program with your colleagues within your institution and within the wider sector. And there are some examples given of how, how this might be done uh, within the application line, guidance online. And as we've mentioned a number of times, we're delighted that this program is being delivered and developed in partnership with ARMA, and it will be deliver, delivered by an expert team of colleagues and facilitators from across the ARMA community. It's going to be fully virtual. Um, we thought this would be the, the easiest in terms of planning, but also to help support accessibility. And it will be delivered from April through to February 2023. So it's going to start pretty quickly after applications close. That's just something worth flagging uh, as you're going through the application process. It will start quite soon afterwards in April uh, of this year. The programme will consist of a, between 45 and 50 contact hours. These will include workshops, seminars, development sprints, but also mentor time and time with a mentor and an advisor. So it will be delivered in a variety of formats. And much of this time uh, will be delivered during working hours and sort of core time. So it's going to be really important that you get the support of your uh, employer as a part of the application process. And we'll touch on this in a moment. One thing that's really worth emphasizing is that this is aimed at a beginner um, audience. So it will be providing quite the basics of the research funding landscape and then moving through. So it doesn't assume any previous funding success. It doesn't require you to have submitted previous funding applications. This really is for those colleagues who are eager and are committed to developing up their research capacity and expertise from quite a, 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 a low base, from just starting on that journey. And then finally, you can see here, the key aims of the programme are to develop um, cohort members' knowledge of the funding landscape and how they can develop a funding application, their skills around some of the key elements which will underpin a successful application around project management, developing full economic costings um, and internal advocacy within their institution. So what are some of those core skills to develop up a highly competitive funding application? But it's actually not just about how sort of learnt skills, it's actually also about building up the confidence. It's becoming more uh, confident in applying your own areas of research interest to an application. And this is where things like mentoring become really important. And finally, the other element, we want to create a cohort of advocates, of individuals who are willing to advocate on behalf of the academic and research library sector in terms of the role of the, themselves and their institutions as research partners and leaders. So these are the four elements that we really would like to develop uh, for cohort members through this programme. In terms of eligibility, once again, this information is on the RA UK website. It is open to any colleague working within an academic library who meets the scheme's criteria. And I could say this can be any unit or department within an academic library. It could be archives, special collections, research data management, conservation, uh, repository services, uh, really any unit or department within an academic library structure. You do not need to work within an RLUK member. This scheme is open to both RLUK and non-RLUK institutions. And in order to apply, we ask that your institution, your, your research or academic library belongs to a recognized higher education institution, a HEI, is um, or belongs to an independent research organization. And there are links to what these are and definitions on the website or belongs to an RLUK member. So these are the three sort of institutional affiliations required to be eligible for this scheme. Your academic library belongs to a UK HEI, an IRO, 
or an RLUK member. The scheme will also, as I've alluded to, really require the commitment of your employer to release you to, from portions of your role um, in order to attend its workshops and its training sessions, which will be delivered largely, if not wholly, during the working day. So we request that as a part of the eligibility that you have an existing employment contract which lasts until the end of the programme or is firmly expected to last until this point for those colleagues um, whose contracts are to be renewed. And finally, that you have the explicit support of your employer to undertake the programme, including in work time. The success and the impact of your participation in this programme will depend in some part on your employer's willingness to support you in your research development and the, uh, your support of your employer to apply the knowledge and the skills that you've learned within your day-to-day -day role. So it really is important to have that institutional support so you can make the most out of participating in this programme. The scheme has a four-part application process. It has an application form, and this is available on the REUK website via a smart survey. In the application form, it's quite short. It isn't designed to be particularly onerous, but through this, you have to outline your areas of interest, the reasons why you're applying to the scheme, um, how it fits in with your role and your ambitions around research, and the perceived benefits that you see that the programme will have on your ability and confidence to undertake research. How will this programme help you? How will this enable you to develop these sort of core skills and confidence? How does it compare with the other activities you've been undertaking? This is really your opportunity to say how this will benefit you. This element will be assessed by a assessment panel. The second is around statements of support, which is required from your employer, and this should confirm that they are willing to support your application and give you sufficient time to participate. And once again, this will also be assessed. So these first two elements will be assessed as a part of the application process. The next two won't be, but are included within the application process. Firstly, um, is a training needs analysis, and this will help Armour to establish um, the, the core needs of the cohort and to really ensure that the programme delivers on the cohort's needs and requirements, that it actually meets the real needs of those participating. So this is really to establish a baseline of the community from the very outset in terms of skills and confidence, but it won't be assessed as a part of the application process. And then finally, in terms around accessibility and declaration, we really want this scheme, this program to be as absolutely as, as accessible as possible. So knowing from the outset any applicants accessibility needs we see is really important. And as you would imagine, of course, this isn't assessed as a part of the application process, but might help us refine some of the programme moving forward from the outset. So these are the four application um, um, uh, elements, um, the application form on the REK website and the statements of support from your employer, which should be sent via email to an address given on the REK website. And we'll put the link once again, um, if it's not already in chat, uh, to the, the outline for um, the application process. Finally, a few things to consider as a part of your application. Um, and these are the things that will be, uh, the applications will be assessed against. Uh, firstly, your commitment to developing your research skills, capacity and confidence, and you expressing this clearly within your application form. The perceived transformative effects that undertaking this program could have on your research ability, skills, and confidence. So how you see this as really benefiting you and what it might enable you to do that you can't currently. Your commitment to sharing your learning widely with your colleagues and with the wider uh, library community following the completion of uh, this program. And we should note that we expect you to do this dissemination and to share your learning really after you've completed the, the, the program, not necessarily during. And REUK will provide and, and highlight a number of opportunities, whether through conferences or blogs um, and other means through which you could share some of your learning. To have your employer support, which I've already mentioned, and also your willingness to be advocates for academic libraries as research partners and leaders.
These are the five assessment criteria that applications will be judged against and will be really important for you to consider when you're writing your application. After all that, the most important thing to stress is that the application deadline is two weeks today. It's Friday the 11th of March at five o'clock. You can see full application guidance, the application form um, and uh, further details on the RLUK website at reuk.ac.uk forward slash research catalyst cohort. There's also an email address there if you have any questions or queries um, when you've been going through this. You can also download the application form as a PDF beforehand so you can see exactly what questions it asks before you start submitting the survey. So that is a brief overview of what's there. There's nothing there that I've just explained that isn't already available, but we'll now stop for just, just under 25 minutes for any questions that you have. If I can invite um, Hamish and Eva and, and Tao, uh, my, my colleagues to be, uh, be on screen as well. And please do either raise your hands or put any questions in chat and I'll stop sharing my screen now. So I can see um, some questions have come through um, and I, I start going through these and if, if uh, any colleagues uh, want to add to it, um, uh, please, please do uh, tell Eva or Hamish. So the first question is, uh, can you apply if you work in a front of house role at an academic library? A absolutely. There is, there, once, as I mentioned, any unit or any department, including front of house. So there's no reason why you, you can't apply. Um, so that's, that's quite a, a, an easy, uh, easy one. So then the next question is um, from uh, Elizabeth. The application form asks you to briefly detail your research interest. Will applicants be expected to have a ready formed research topic or can this be further explored during the scheme? As uh, suggested, this is um, um, really designed for those colleagues who are beginning their research journey. So I think having a, a sense of your research interest, your area that you wish to develop, will be an important thing for you to consider. But we're not expecting a fully form, formed research question. So uh, no, that, that's the case. Um, and an area is really helpful, um, but not having a, a fully formed question. And hopefully by the end, you may have a fully formed question, but this will help you on that journey. So in terms of the assessment panel, what steps will be taken to ensure an inclusive approach is taken to candidate selection? So the um, application uh, assessment panel is made up of representatives, not only from RUK, the AHRC and ARMA, but also colleagues from uh, the wider research library community. So there is a variety of different opinions and uh, backgrounds represented on the panel within and beyond um, our UK members and across professional practices um, as well. So a variety of opinions there. Um, all of the applications will be judged um, on the uh, criteria which have been published, which you can um, see there, and um, will, be, will be treated um, um, the, the same effectively um, um, based on those criteria. Um, I think that's probably what I'd say. I'm not sure whether any other colleagues uh, would have any further comments on that part of the process. I think the, the assessment process is outlined there on the um, web page, and of course we wouldn't, we wouldn't want this to be absolutely inclusive and will be a fair, uh, fair process. Diane asks, can you apply if you have done some research before, but not on a funded research project? Um, yes. Um, once again, it goes back to that point that this is a, a beginner uh, program, um, so we're very much focused on that. Um, but no, you can have been involved in a research project before, um, and there is an opportunity there for you to explain what experience you have within the application form um, and how this program will build on that experience. And I think that's one of the important things to cite is that transformative effect. So even if you have been involved in a program previously or in a research application or project previously, how will this program build on top of that experience and enable you to go to the next level? There's a great question around uh, what would your views uh, on applications who already have a PhD, but in an unrelated field 
and undertaken some time ago. Um, likewise, this is open to you to apply to. Um, I think the important thing, once again, is that transformative effect. So if your PhD was some time ago and on a very different field, this program still has a, a and your research interest is in a, in a very different field now, and there is that separation in terms of uh, that your focus, then um, if you can justify and, and outline the transformative effect you expect this program to have on your research ability, then absolutely. I think we, if um, you were looking to be a part of this program to further build on a, a sort of a, a, an area of deep research expertise, um, that you've done your PhD on, that the transformative effect probably wouldn't be quite as great. But I think absolutely that is open uh, to you. If you've already got a PhD in an unrelated field and take undertake it some time ago, I think, yep, yeah, that's absolutely fine. In terms of how many places there are as part of the cohort, there are 18 places available on the, on the cohort. And that's why we're undertaking this competitive process. Uh, because we expect that there will be a high level of demand. Um, but yes, there are, there are 18 places um, available. And uh, Teresa then asked the question, how many applications do you tend to get? Well, this is the first year, so we don't know. Um, we're hoping for lots. We're hoping for lots of uh, good and strong uh, applications, um, which really do align with their colleagues' areas of research interest and areas they want to develop. But we don't know how many applications we're going to get. We have suggested on the guidance that if your institution intends to submit multiple applications, you may want to have an internal application process to ensure um, uh, that these are competitive, but it will be a competitive process. We should also say this is the first year, as we say, this is almost a pilot year, and I'm sure any learning that we have from this year can be applied to, uh, to future years if this program uh, uh, continues. Uh, we in terms of another question, we said, do you prioritize applications from postgraduates and or professionals or are undergraduates welcome to apply? So this is very much aimed at colleagues who are working within and have a contractual relationship with an academic or research library and have a contract which goes beyond February 2023. We do not prioritize applications in terms of um, a postgraduates, for example, um, they're very much uh, for those colleagues who are, have professional contracts or working within an academic library. Um, this, these could be members of the postgraduate community, um, but we're very much focused on those colleagues who are working and have that contractual relationship within um, a research or academic library. We don't, uh, we, we put in the guidance explicitly that this program's fully open to colleagues on part-time or full-time. We're, we're not um, concerned about contracts, but there should be that contractual relationship and a desire to develop professionally uh, and continue to develop pro professionally within academic and research libraries. In terms of uh, another question from Simona, uh, what would be your views on applica applicants who are currently PhD uh, candidates? I think once again, it goes back to the transformative effect of uh, your participation in this program um, and your desire to develop your research uh, ability and confidence in a career within academic libraries. Um, I think it will depend in some areas in terms of where your PhD is focused and we wouldn't want this to this program to be sort of an extension of your postgraduate training, for example. Um, I'm not sure, Tao, do you have any reflections on, on that? I was just unmuting. Um, I think I would agree with what you just said, Matt. So I think um, if you are um, that the, the primary consideration is whether or not you have a contractual uh, um, uh, uh, agreement with the library um, or the unit that you're working with, um, because this is primarily for people who are um, interested in developing um, their professional practice and research within that context. Thanks, thanks, Tal. I think that does um, cover it. 
And I should say, if um, any of these questions, when we respond, throw up further questions in your minds, if there's not time today, please do um, email the address given on the scheme website as well. Will this be an annual program? Well, this is a pilot this year. Um, so we're, we're certainly interested in, in continuing to develop up the skills and capacity and confidence of the academic library community. Um, and we will do a thorough evaluation of this year's program uh, and make a judgment then uh, to, towards the end whether we make this an annual one. But certainly we are open to exploring that through this year's cohort program, but this is very much seen as a pilot year. And then uh, Amelie uh, asks, would this scheme be suitable for an individual wishing to develop a topic with a view to studying slash applying for a PhD? Or is the remit really more for the development of a funded research project that will be more collaborative? I think it is open to those colleagues who may have an interest in furthering their uh, skills and qualifications through a PhD route. So um, the programme itself, as I just highlighted, and, and if um, even Hamish wants to, to maybe add to this in a moment, is very much there to provide that wide landscape view of opportunities to apply to academic funding. Um, PhD funding, uh, some of the learning may be relevant to PhD applications, but it will not be addressing that um, specifically. It is looking at that broad brush of what makes a good funding application. So this, the scheme um, probably will be suitable for those individuals wishing to develop a topic for their future career, and that may include a PhD, but it won't be, definitely won't be exclusively around that. And as you suggest in your question, there will be a very collaborative element um, and collaborative funding uh, application element to the, to the programme. Uh, uh, Eva or Hamish or Tav, would you have anything to, to add to that? I think you're right, Matt. I think it's. Um, I think the key thing here, if you are looking at a PhD, is to show your ambition beyond the PhD, um, what you're planning to do next. Um, I, I don't think this is a device for you securing your PhD. I think we're looking for you to share your ambition going forward, um, your passion for your subject, and where that is going to take you. Um, if a PhD comes along on the way, I think that's that's great. But I don't think that's the primary purpose of this program. I think it's much more to to reach beyond the PhD. And if it can be collaborative, I think that's a, that's a great thing. We've we've had some really good examples in the session this morning about the role that, that scholarly communications and collections can play as a collaborative uh, agent, if you like, uh, across the institution as a whole. But it probably doesn't need to be necessarily collaborative. But I think you need to articulate the research quite clearly in terms of what you want to be doing. Thanks, Hamish. So those are all the, the questions in chat. So maybe we've sort of rattled through those with some with some speed. Are there any other questions that colleagues would like to put in chat? Or feel free to raise your hand as well. You can raise your hand and, and just um, ask uh, verbally if you've got any um, questions or, or, or perspectives or reflections. Well, there is a lot of content online. We've been deliberately quite thorough in the guidance that is available. I'm not sure just if when we're waiting just a few moments for colleagues to have any few final questions, whether Tao or, or Hamish or any reflections or either from either Armour or AHRC around the ambitions of the programme uh, and what we're looking forward to in particular. I think you just used the key word here, which is ambition. And I think um, the word I used to use in the old days when I was talking to uh, to new researchers is is passion. And I think what um, what uh, you very probably have is a, is a passion for your subject is is an ambition for your subject. And I think my my guidance is is to think about that. Follow your dreams. There's an opportunity to follow your dreams here. Not because there's a source of funds that will fund all your dreams in one go, and I suspect your dreams will be endless. But I think if you know where you're going, where you are heading for, then think big and then 
you can chunk it back into chunks as it were so if you know where you're going that's a great thing and then it is very much easier to identify funding uh, that enables you to take those steps along the way um, and i always used to have this conversation about about no know, knowing where you're going um, because if you if you can if you know where you're going if you've got that dream you articulate it really well and I think that's one one hint I would give in terms of applying for grant funding is being able to communicate your dream, communicate what you want to do. And and when you see that, if you're a funder, when you see that kind of thing, it really ignites you. It really excites a funder because they, they think, oh, yes, this person's got this new idea, this this great idea. And. I've so often seen in the, in the university setting people being restricted by a particular funding scheme and they start with the funding scheme and they're restricted by that. Um, and I would never do it that way. I would always start with your dream and then take a journey along the way. Don't go for the biggest fish because you might not be successful, but there's, there might be some very nice stepping stone initial grants that take you on that journey and allow you to pursue your dream. So um, I, I think today's session has been really inspirational. Actually, our earlier speakers have talked all about the excitement of research, and it is exciting. It really is. There's a real opportunity here for this scheme to encourage that and help people along their way. Um, thanks. Thanks, Hamish. And anything to tell from the HRC side at all? Um, I, I was going, I wasn't going to, I, mean, I couldn't put it as well as Hamish has just put it in terms of, 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 of dream and passion. I would add one more, which is don't, don't be too scared. Don't be put off. Um, I think one of the things that, and I don't even come from an academic background, purely sort of research management and, and, and sort of research policy, but I think one of the things that I often hear is, well, you know, we, 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 we don't talk like that. We, we, we're not sure where we are when people talk about methodologies and theoretical frameworks and literature reviews. It, it's just terminology, I think, you know, and it's terminology um, that is applied to um, specific aspects of academic work, um, which if you think about it, when we drill down, will we'll, we'll very often equally apply to um, um, your professional practice um, in some capacity. So I think it's um, don't be afraid to ask questions and um, don't be too um, worried if the first time you sort of enter a research seminar um, or you read academic papers, you go, ah, this isn't me, this has got nothing to do with me, it's a separate, it's a completely separate, different um, um, world to which I, I, I cannot gain entry um, because the purpose of this um, programme is, 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 is to um, help um, remove those barriers perceived um, or, or real. So. Tao, I love that. I love what you've just said, because I think many people coming into research can feel a bit of an imposter. You know, they can be sitting in the room and there's people around them with professorial uh, degrees, with, with the PhDs, um, professoriates, that kind of thing. And I think it, it, if, if colleagues are really enthused about doing what they want to do, they should definitely, definitely not be put off thinking that they're an imposter in the room. But I do like what you said about if you're not successful the first time around, I'm slightly paraphrasing you here, but that is, that is you know, that does happen. You might not be successful the first time around, but that stage of applying, that process of applying for grant funding will develop your research to the next level without even realizing it, because you will have thought through a great idea to a level of detail that if you're not successful, you'll get some feedback back from the funder, and many do give brilliant feedback, which enables you to level up to the next level. And already, even, even if you didn't apply, even if you weren't successful with that grant, your research will have progressed up a level, which will make you more likely to get funding the next time around. So never be put off by the fear of failure here. Um, it, it's, it's managing that, it's coping with that. It's, it's just a way, it's part of the process almost. Um, yeah. 
Thank you, Tao. Thank you, Henry. So we've got Don't Be Afraid, we've got Passion, we've got Ambition, and we've got <laughs> Evolution. Um, thanks to Fiona from earlier. I've seen a really important question that's just come in uh, from Becky. Uh, will, application, will applicants who are unsuccessful receive feedback? We'll try and give some. It, the, it really depends on numbers, but we'll try and uh, give, give at least some acknowledgement and, and, and very brief feedback. But it will probably be quite brief simply because of the demand that we're expecting, but certainly we, we hope to. And if you're not successful for this year, and it does run in future years, we certainly encourage future applications as well. So thank you so much for everyone who has joined us today. We really do appreciate all your time for sharing, for your um, expertise and for your questions. Um, so thank you for being with us. There is and um, there are lots of details online. So in terms of the Research Catalyst cohort programme, deadline says two weeks a day at five o'clock on the 11th of March. There was full guidance online. There's also an email address you can email if you've got any specific questions and please do. This is a real opportunity to, as, as um, Hamish and Tal said, do not be afraid and to try things. Um, we will also have another event. Our next event as a part of the research engagement program, the wider program is exploring the technician commitments and the application of the technician commitments to research and academic libraries as centers of technical and specialist expertise. And that's on the 27th of April and further details can be found on the website below and you can also register through that link as well.